You know, we chat a lot about what spatial thinking is. Let's get really practical now and illustrate what spatial thinking means and how it can impact a person's thinking during a typical day. Let's say this person is going to the airport and getting on an airplane. So, something that you might do on a typical day. How would you think spatially all throughout the day at various scales? Also, then we'll conclude by, okay, so what? How does it impact our lives? According to the Learning to Think Spatially report from the National Research Council, spatially literate people need to have the habit of mind of knowing where, when, how, and why to think spatially. In this and in other thoughts, let's explore how these habits of mind might manifest themselves in 15 different ways in a typical day in the life of a spatial thinker. At the conclusion, we'll talk about why does it matter? Why should we care? Let's say today you are going to board a commercial airliner. So you board an airport shuttle at your home that picks you up and immediately you're faced with a spatial task that we're all familiar with. You must arrange your luggage so that you can easily pull it out once you arrive at the airport. You also have to take note of its appearance and location relative to the luggage from the other shuttle passengers. Once underway, you drive past a street that is adjoined by many used car lots, apartment buildings that look like they were formerly old motels, and gas stations. Because of this type of land use, you hypothesize that the, st the street was, before the advent of limited access freeways, the main route from your city during the middle decades of the 20th century out to the surrounding countryside. Once on a freeway near the airport, you pass a rest area and wonder how long the typical person spends there, what the typical route of walking would be from the parking lot to the rest area buildings, and what the influence of a visitor center inside the rest area and traveling with a dog, for example, might have on the time spent and the route taken by each visitor. You think about the people at the State Department of Transportation who manage this and hundreds of other rest areas with a geographic information system, or GIS. The shuttle reaches the crest of a small hill, and you think about the nearly imperceptible hills that are numerous and much more important than they seem, for they may form the boundaries of drainage basins that are hundreds of square kilometers in size. The land use noticeably changes as you near the airport. The cargo and commercial operators, rental car companies, hotels, convention centers, and other services together may occupy up to dozens of square kilometers. You wonder how the land use evolved over time. What did it used to look like? And what, the, what did the land look like before, when the airport was small? And what the native vegetation was like before the modern, perhaps non-native land, landscaping was planted? You think about how this airport land use differs, differs from others around the country, and how these collectively are different from others around the world. I'll always remember the first time I flew into Gatwick Airport in London. As one of the busiest airports serving London and the largest single runway airport in the world, I was amazed to find sheep grazing in the field directly across the street from an airport, something I would never have seen in North America. Who made the decision to protect the open space near Gatwick? And why have those efforts perhaps failed elsewhere?